Welcome to The Ideal Cast. I'm your host, Gene Kim. I'm an author and researcher and have been studying high-performing technology organizations for 23 years. I started this podcast to better understand how and why organizations work the way they do, both in the ideal and not ideal. In season one, I was able to interview some of the people I admire most within the DevOps enterprise community, and I hope you have learned as much as I have. And season two is going to be incredible because I get to interview so many incredible experts, often outside of the technology community, who share so many surprising insights relevant to any leader to better enable their organizations to compete and win. In this season, you'll hear me interview amazing people such as Dr. Ron Westrom, who created the famous Westrom Organizational Typology Model, which I suspect nearly everyone who's read the State of DevOps report is already very familiar with. Admiral John Richardson, who served as Chief of Naval Operations for four years, which is the highest ranking naval officer in the U.S. Navy, and who previously served as a Director of U.S. Naval Reactors, which has been talked about so much throughout Season 1. And Dr. Gail Murphy, Professor of Computer Science at the University of British Columbia, who is one of my favorite academic researchers in all things related to architecture, modularity, and developer productivity. If you enjoyed Season 1 of The Ideal Cast, I know you'll enjoy Season 2. In this opening episode of Season 2, you're going to hear Part 1 of my two-part conversation with Admiral John Richardson. I learned so much from these conversations, and I suspect you'll find them as mind-expanding as I did. Here's the interview. You're listening to The Ideal Cast with Gene Kim, brought to you by IT Revolution. Welcome to the first episode of Season 2 of The Ideal Cast. Today, I'm so delighted that I have on Admiral John Richardson, formerly Chief of Naval Operations for the U.S. Navy, which is that service's highest ranking officer. Over the years, Admiral Richardson's name has come up over and over again in my conversations with Dr. Steven Spear, and I was so delighted when I was able to finally meet him last year. I am so grateful for how he tolerated the volumes of questions that I asked him, some of which I've been carrying around in my head literally for over 30 years. I learned so much from our interactions that I had to interview him for this podcast, because I am certain that all of you will learn something as well. To motivate this statement, I feel like the best thing I can do right now is recite some of his amazing achievements. He served as the Chief of Naval Operations for four years, which is the professional head of the U.S. Navy, which reports into the Secretary of the Navy. Before that, he served as the Director of U.S. Naval Reactors, which is comprehensively responsible for the safe and reliable operation of the U.S. Navy Nuclear Propulsion Program, which Dr. Spear has written so extensively about in his book, The High Velocity Edge, and has been the topic of so many conversations on this podcast. This position is so important that it is led by a four-star admiral, of which there are only six in the entire U.S. Navy. And he also commanded the Los Angeles-class submarine, the USS Honolulu. I think that this community of technology leaders can learn so much from him and his experiences. Everything from the problems he had to solve, the way he leads, informed so much by his technology background, having gotten his master's degree in electrical engineering at MIT. Now that he's retired from the U.S. Navy, he serves on the board of directors of numerous companies, including Boeing, the world's largest aerospace company, and Exelon, a Fortune 100 company which operates the largest fleet of nuclear plants in America and delivers power to over 10 million customers. So, I've mentioned how excited I am that I have Admiral Richardson on today, but it may not be obvious why. So let me take a moment to state something that I'm coming to believe. As you likely know, I've been studying high-performing technology organizations for 22 years, and since 2014, I've been studying how DevOps is being adopted not by the technology giants, the Facebooks, Amazons, Netflix, Googles, and Microsofts of the world, but instead by large, complex organizations who have been around for decades or even centuries. These are the largest brands across every industry vertical who are all trying to figure out how to respond effectively to the digital disruption agenda. And based on some data points, I'm starting to believe that it's going to be the Department of Defense and our armed services that will figure out how to do this in a repeatable, systematic way first. I think there are two reasons why. The first reason is the urgency of the mission. When your mission is to defend the nation, to prepare for a future fight against a thinking adversary who is just as motivated to use technology to gain the advantage, it creates genuine urgency. 
This is true when competing against smaller adversaries, such as what was described on this podcast by Dave Silverman in the Team of Teams context, but it's even more true when competing against peer or near-peer adversaries. I think the second reason is something that became so evident to me during this interview. It is so clear that the military invests so much time and effort in training their leaders. I've always been amazed at how much the military invests in formal education, on-the-job training, and increasingly on self-education. It always amazes me when I talk to senior military officers, how expert they are on so many topics, whether it's doctrine, military history, leadership, leadership development, supply chains, and so much more. Someone told me just last week how senior military leaders must spend five to seven years or more in postgraduate education programs to get to where they are which is often considerably more than their commercial counterparts in industry. I think these two factors will contribute to faster adoption and integration of digital capabilities into mission achievement in the DOD than in the commercial sector. So in this episode, I learned so much from Admiral Richardson, including why high velocity learning was so important to him when he was the chief of Naval operations and how he operationalized creating a high velocity learning dynamic across the entire US Navy his theories of how we need to balance compliance and creativity, and some very specific advice on what leaders must do when the balance tilts too much towards compliance, when we've taken away the ability for people to unleash their full creative potential, which can be the source of incredible asymmetric advantage, why he believes radical delegation is so important, and how he came to believe that creating leadership communities and connections are so important, and we explore where software competencies must show up in modern organizations. This is part one of a two-part interview. I trust you will be as dazzled as I was on what Admiral Richardson has to share. I learned so much and found it to be so inspirational. Okay, let's get to the interview. Admiral Richardson, I'm so honored that you're here. So I've introduced you in my words Can you introduce yourself in your own words and describe what you've been working on these days? Yeah, well, thanks, Gene. And let me just say how thrilled I am to be here with you. I've been a fan of your work for some time. And so to be actually speaking with you like this is is really the thrill of a lifetime. And I'm uh, embarking on what my wife has uh, affectionately called Act Two. She's not letting me call it <laughs> retirement. And uh, Act 2 consists of you know a number of different activities, a portfolio of things that includes service on the boards of directors for Boeing and Exelon, as you said, and also another nuclear company called uh, BWXT, which provides nuclear components, is into radio pharmaceuticals and some very creative work in the nuclear business. And then a couple of private boards in the artificial intelligence arena and uh, the offshore uh, support vessel arena, some very, very sophisticated, complex vessels and doing some consulting, helping other leaders, particularly in the private sector and also in the national security business, uh, to do what I can to help. So all about continuing the, I guess, the agenda that I tried to set in terms of being a, a leader of people, a leader of leaders, and a leader that wants to build organizations that are continually learning. And by the way, it thrills me that other organizations are going to be able to benefit from your vast experience. So I have a big smile on my face. We also have on Dr. Steve Spear, who's been on so many of these podcast episodes. Steve, why don't you briefly introduce yourself as well? Yeah, thank you, Gene. And it's good to uh, talk with you and CNO Richardson. So uh, real quick, I was made curious probably 30 years ago as to why seemingly similar organizations amongst those some were able to perform at such a higher level than everybody else. And through some uh, fairly intense study, what we discovered is that their ability to manage the collective through which we try to do collaborative work, their ability to manage that to really tap deeply into people's creativity and have it expressed as useful products and services out into society, it was off the charts. And one of the things that was real encouraging is that as different as they were by sector, there were some common principles, almost like a a science of organizations or science of systems. So I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out parsimonious as possible what that science is and how to bring it into practice. Awesome. So Admiral Richardson, we were able to meet because of Steve. (laughs) So can you describe what about Steve's work caught your attention and what made it so important to you? Yeah, well, first I was uh, introduced to Steve by a colleague of mine who was a fellow submariner, very, very good friend, Dennis Murphy, who now works for Amgen. And he had become familiar with Steve's work and called me up and said, hey, you've got to take a look at this guy's thinking. And uh, so I dove in, got the, uh, I think, Steve, I I got the book from 
first and read through it. At this point, I was just about to become the director of Naval Reactors, and lo and behold, <laughs> there's Naval Reactors as a major case study in the book. And so, you know, Steve had me at hello here with respect to the way he approaches this question. And then, you know, I got in touch with him, and it's been even more rich, you know, this collaboration for well, probably close to 10 years now, Steve, I think, at the time we've been working together. And the thing that I find really powerful about Steve's approach is, uh, one, as he said, it's pretty parsimonious, right? I would, I would call it simple, but not simplistic, and also, and also not easy to implement. Don't confuse uh, simple with easy. It's actually you know, challenging to, to achieve those levels of performance that he described with such a simple approach. I also liked it because it's scalable, Right. And so, you know, the, the cycle that Steve uh, describes could work at every dimension of an organization from the, you know, a small work center all the way up to uh, a corporate level or an enterprise level. It's measurable, right? It's based on feedback. And so there's, you know, there's some hardcore measurements. You, you know, when you're making progress. And then uh, the thing that really captured me was that, you know, by virtue of taking this uh, very simple but powerful approach centered around feedback, you engage the uh, people in your organization in a way that kind of sustains all of the excitement and uh, thrill of a startup. But you can you can capture that and sustain it even for a mature organization. When you get that type of excitement coming to work every single day, you, you can't beat it. And so there's this there's this kind of very analytic, but also a, a very powerful human dimension to uh, Steve's approach to it. So that's that's what made it you know, such a rich relationship as it is today. <clears throat> One thing that Steve shared with me was your efforts to create a learning dynamic across the entire enterprise that is the U.S. Navy. Can you describe why that's important? <laughs> why did it seem like that's something that was worthy of your time? I think it's going to be the decisive factor. In fact, uh, if you uh, what one lens to look at the difference between you know winning and losing, victory and defeat, success and failure, particularly when you're up against a thinking adversary or competitor is who learns more quickly, right? And so, you know, Steve and I have collaborated on a lot of different examples where it wasn't necessarily the technology, it wasn't necessarily the plan that you went in with. It was really who had the better system to sense the environment, adapt to that environment, learn, spread those lessons across the organization, and move out in a different direction faster than the competition. And so, I, and as things have sped up, right, with the, you know, the advent of the revolution that you spend so much time thinking about, Gene, it's become even more important, it seems to me, to be able to learn that much faster, right? And so mm. I think it was absolutely fundamental to uh, the success of the organization, particularly in a competitive environment, including you know, conflict. And can you talk a little bit more about the program that you would set up to you know, go from that very aspirational goal and <laughs> that statement that uh, winner of the future fight depends on ability to learn and adapt? I mean, how do you go from a statement like that to influencing hundreds of thousands of sailors? Yeah. You know? Well, the way that we approached it was to build it in as a separate uh, and distinct what I'll call a line of effort or a line of emphasis in our, our highest level plan, right? So the the plan that I signed out for the Navy included this learning line of effort. And, uh, and it also included some more traditional things that, that address the importance of our people and leader development. It addressed the importance of our mission and our operational doctrine, as you say. But this uh, learning thing was new to everybody, you know, and it took some time really to continue to talk through it and uh, bring people into an understanding of, hey, why learning? And then exactly what does that mean? You know, and so the first iteration in the Navy was sort of, if I wasn't in charge of a formal school, I'd breathe the sigh of relief because that learning stuff, you know, <laughs> that's for schools and I, I get off. And then, we, so we had to work through, no, nope, this is everybody. Everybody's got to be learning <laughs> at every level. And so it, it it just took some soak time, to be honest, Gene. You know, it's a lot of communication. I would say that uh, when you do something this new in an organization, and a lot of times leaders underestimate the amount of just personal energy and fortitude it's going to take to see it through. And so, you know, I had I was lucky to have a number of leaders that uh, really pitched in, and made this happen. And uh, and it's still unfolding, Gene. It's it's something that'll will never stop. You've just got to do that. So you set some sort of high-level goals 
and then that penetrates down into the organization and each person has a program that uh, at their level of the team supports the, the higher level objectives and move out you just make it part of the business. Uh, that's awesome, and I, I love that statement where uh, that sigh of relief when you when you are sure that it's someone else's job. Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't stuff you delegated away. We've all been um, there. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I was just uh, I was reading is it U.S. MDP, the Marine Corps Doctrine Seven, was all about learning, and uh, there was a quote from Brigadier General Lorna Maylock. I found that ordinary people can do the extraordinary who are committed to experiential learning are intellectually curious and possess an unquenchable desire to acquire new knowledge. And I love this, how she ends that quote, this may be our only advantage in the future fight. I just thought it was yeah. a, just a wonderfully evoke so much of uh, what you said. Can you talk about maybe one thing that you did to uh, that was effective in demonstrating to what extent you are owning your piece of creating this learning dynamic? First of all, it's really not about me, Gene. And so uh, I would give the credit to uh, some of the people that really worked so hard and creatively to uh, set up, I would say, a curriculum for leader development where we kind of tried to bake these types of skills into uh, how we train and develop our new leaders, right? And so there's a lot, I, I think, that goes with that because once you train everybody to learn, they're going to want to go and do that, right? They're going to they're going to want to go and lead uh, and, and put all of these skills to work. And so the aspects and the ingredients for delegation, right? So they, you can go off and let them do this learning, this experimentation, this adapting on their own with full ownership of their part of the organization. You know, that's watching that happen is just uh, very, very exciting. I've got to tell you that uh, from my particular standpoint, I try and live by verse 17 of the Tao, right? Where you know, the ultimate leader, the people say they did it themselves. And so if I can be completely, you know, <laughs> invisible <laughs> in this and the organization just gets better, uh, that would be, you know, my ultimate goal. But they did a tremendous amount of work to adjust our leader development process to uh, bring together leaders that would give everybody trust and confidence in one another that they could do that delegation. We all shared the same value system and uh, we were going to learn on the fly and help one another. And just to make sure I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, you're saying that that outcome of that group coalescing and owning those objectives is a point of particular pride and evidence that this actually moved the needle on, on these objectives that you talked about? Yeah, we hope so. And in fact, one sort of very discreet, measurable example would be after about... Uh, two and a half years, we'd achieved a lot of the objectives in the first plan. And so it was time to refresh the plan and put out a new set of uh, objectives and, and get everybody uh, going on those. And by and the way, what year was that? This, right. uh, this was probably uh, 2018 for the second oh, awesome. uh, second edition. And I can send you these things if you like. Oh, gosh. Yeah. oh yes. <laughs> yeah. And so as we were thinking about the structure of uh, version two, we wanted it to be continuous, right? In fact, we built in this kind of very DevOps thing. Hey, this is version one, implying that it's going to be modified. And so this was the design for maintaining maritime superiority version two. And I said, hey, you know, I know that this uh, learning line of effort is really giving people a challenge. You know, do we want to work it in or, or, or eliminate it? And the feedback was after they thought about it, no, we've really come to kind of like it, you know, so we're going to, we'd like to keep it in version two. So uh, that was a nice validation that uh, it had some penetration into the organization and uh, it was being adopted. And what was potentially on the table to be taken out or to be left in? Whether it was going to be a discrete line of emphasis, oh. you know, and so I was like, hey, if this is too complicated, we can think about maybe, you know, another way to right. get at her and write it out. And they said, no, 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 we, we you know, we, we've kind of come to like, like it, it, so let's leave it in. <laughs> Gene here. Okay, Admiral Richardson did indeed send me those documents, and holy cow, they are amazing. I had mentioned just how much fun I had reading some of the U.S. Marine Corps doctrinal publications such as MCDP-1 and the recently published MCDP-7 that I just mentioned. I didn't realize until I had read the documents that Admiral Richardson sent that these were public planning documents that serve a somewhat similar function. I'll just read about how it was announced on the U.S. Navy website. 
The headline reads, CNO releases a design for maintaining maritime superiority from Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson, January 5, 2016. This is a document that addresses how the Navy will adapt to changes in the security environment and continue to fulfill its mission. And then there's a link to read the document. So that looks like, you know, the equivalent of a press release announcing the availability of this document. And a quick Google search shows how widely this document was read and commented upon within the naval community and the defense industry. I loved reading it because it does such a superb job in doing what great vision and mission documents do. I want to read a couple of parts of this document, especially the introductions, for a couple of reasons. One, it's so clearly written. And two, there are some real surprises, which I think many of you will find quite inspirational. So this is the 1.0 document published in January 2016. And the version 2.0 document, which Admiral Richardson mentioned, was published nearly three years later. I will put links to both documents in the show notes. So version one was an eight-page document. I'm going to read through it just because so much of what Admiral Richardson talks about you can find here. Okay, on the first page, uh, there's a one-paragraph mission statement. The United States Navy will be ready to conduct prompt and sustained combat incident to operations at sea. Our Navy will protect America from attack and preserve America's strategic influence in key regions of the world, U.S. naval forces and operations, from the sea floor to space, from deep water to the littorals, and in the information domain, will deter aggression and enable peaceful resolution of crises on terms acceptable to the United States and our allies and partners. If deterrence fails, the Navy will conduct decisive combat operations to defeat any enemy. <laughs> Great mission. All right. Right after that is a one-paragraph introduction. My favorite line in there is, we'll learn and adapt, always getting better, striving to the limits of performance. This cannot be a top-down effort. Everybody must contribute. The next section is strategic environment. Uh, he paints and evokes some of the history of the U.S. Navy going back hundreds of years. This is about two and a half pages. The really great part here is that he frames three problems that shape the strategy and his thinking. I'm going to read a couple of sections just because I think it's, one, marvelously written, so clearly communicates the urgency that he feels, and I think you'll find it incredibly relevant to the work any technology leader will feel viscerally, <laughs> regardless of industry. The first of the three global forces he talks about is how the world is increasingly reliant upon traffic on the ocean, seas, and waterways. He calls it the classic maritime system. As the global economy continues to expand and become more connected, this maritime system is becoming more heavily used, more stressed, and more contested than ever before. <laughs> the next two astound me. A second increasingly influential force is the rise of the global information system. The information that rides on the servers, undersea cables, satellites, and wireless networks that increasingly envelop and connect the globe. Newer than the maritime system, the information system is more pervasive, enabling an even greater multitude of connections between people and at a much lower cost of entry. <laughs> Literally, an individual with a computer is a powerful actor in the system. Information, now passed in near real time across links that continue to multiply, is in turn driving an accelerated rate of change, from music to medicine, from microfinance to missiles. Okay, uh, here's the third one, which mentions Moore's Law. The third interrelated force is increasing rate of technological creation and adoption. This is not just in information technologies, where Dr. Gordon Moore's projections of exponential advances in processing, storage, and switches continue to be realized. Scientists are also unlocking new properties of commonplace materials and creating new materials altogether at astonishing speeds. And as technology is introduced at an ever-accelerating rate, it is being adopted by society just as fast. People are using these new tools as quickly as they are introduced in new and novel ways. <laughs> So, for anyone in the technology community, isn't it interesting that two of the three factors that are shaping naval strategy are technology-related? I just find that so super interesting. It just shows that the work that we are doing in this community matter to people who matter. Okay, one last thing I'll read here, just because it's so prevalent in the DoD. I'll quote, and the competitors themselves have changed. For the first time in 25 years, the United States is facing a return to great power competition. These goals of potential adversaries are backed by a growing arsenal of high-end warfighting capabilities, 
many of which are focused specifically on our vulnerabilities and are increasingly designed from the ground up to leverage the maritime, technological, and information systems. They continue to develop and field information-enabled weapons, both kinetic and non-kinetic, with increasing range, precision, and destructive capacity. What I love this document is that it communicates so clearly and simply in a way that can be copied by others. So if you watch the presentation given by the Kessel Run team, that amazing program in the U.S. Air Force, you're going to hear very similar statements of goals and aspirations. Uh, This was a presentation that was given at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in Las Vegas last year by Adam Furtado, a branch chief at Kessel Run, and Lauren Knausenberger, deputy CIO inside the U.S. Air Force. Dr. Andy Grove, CEO of Intel for many years, said, you have to keep repeating your message over and over and over again just when you feel like you can't repeat it anymore, it's only then that people actually start understanding your message. The next section is four lines of effort. Uh, Admiral Richardson wasn't kidding. The learning dynamic is the second of the four. So the first one is strengthen naval power at and from sea. And the second is achieve high velocity learning at every level. And the third is strengthen our Navy team for the future. The fourth is expand and strengthen our network of partners. And again, just to underscore what I think is so interesting is that it's all written out. Reminds me of that quote, in order to speak well, you need to be able to think well. And that usually requires being able to write well. I'm cognizant that I'm reading a lot from a document that anyone can download and read by themselves. But I do so just because I think these documents model so well what so many of us in the technology leadership community are trying to do. Set high standards, create a sense of urgency, communicate values that we think are important. And I think these letters just do a phenomenal job in showing how writing can be an enormous aid to helping achieve those objectives. Okay, back to the interview. I want to ask before I forget, I mean, I I love that sort of end outcome that you state where the organization has fully owned the objectives, you know, their hearts are in it and they're bringing their best energy to the achievement of those outcomes and the leaders left with a not left to do, maybe just to uh, overstate uh, what you said. I mean, what do you do with the leader who is actually afraid of that concept? Because what they might hear is, oh, holy cow, right? Uh, You've given all the authority to the team. They make their own decisions. It's their ideas. They're going to put the energy into it. And they're left thinking, what is there left for me to do? Right. (laughs) Right? And uh, and I think there's a fear there that uh, now I'm utterly irrelevant. Uh, Can can you maybe just directly speak to that uh, anonymous person who might feel that way? What is it that you would want them to see? I would say that I can 100% guarantee that there are things as a leader that uh, only you can do. And that uh, what you have done by virtue of enabling the team to perform at their maximum level and do a lot of the things that perhaps you were doing before, you've learned that those are actually things you can delegate very effectively, in fact, more effectively than uh, doing it all yourself. And now that illuminates those things that perhaps only you can do. And so you need to you know, spend some time identifying what those things are because uh, they're super important to the organization and you're the only one who can get them done. And so it provides you some intellectual space to uh, get after those very important things, strategic thinking, you know, working at uh, across, you know, leader to leader at that at, at your peer level, et cetera. You know, those are things that only you can do. They may not take as much time as you're used to spending, but they have a much bigger impact. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Maybe to go into some uh, concrete scenarios, I think we've all witnessed situations where an organization that once exhibited these kind of dynamic learning characteristics they start to calcify. Uh, So when I attended Steve's workshop at uh, MIT, I met him in 2014. I I love the way he cast the U.S. space program in the 1960s as one of fundamental dynamic learning. I recently uh, read Gene Kranz's book, Failure is Not an Option. And I love the way he described his role in it. And uh, part of it was saving Apollo 13. And even in the events leading up to it, he described the NASA philosophy as high risk, high gain. Mm-hmm. And as he described that engineering discipline, it reminded me so much of the naval reactor program that was described as the of what Admiral Rickover built. Mm-hmm. So I'd love this narrative that says uh, something was lost in the U.S. space program as it went from this culture of learning to a culture of compliance. And it was most notable after they embarked on the U.S. space shuttle program, was pitched to Congress as a low-cost, frequent access to space. The focus became around turnaround times and safe 
access to space. We started sending school teachers in space, even though the failure rates were probably still around 5%. So under those conditions, um, due to structure and dynamics, signals were starting to get suppressed. Deviances would get normalized. So once uh, if a tile falls off the shuttle, we might say it happened before, so it should be okay. So can you take, talk a little bit about whether you've seen these contrasts between a learning culture and a compliance culture? And what advice would you give to leaders to ensure that you know, what was once a learning organization doesn't devolve into this compliance culture? Uh, how do you keep organizations from getting into a rut and, uh, as I've heard you say, prevent the barnacles from uh, growing on? Yeah, them? nice nautical uh, uh, analogy there. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it, it, there is always in high-risk, uh, high-gain, or, or I would say high-consequence organizations, there's a very appropriate focus on risk management, right? Because the consequence of failure can be existential, right? I mean, you could go out of business or something like that, uh, uh, or, or the, the very, very high consequences. And so as we like to think about it, it was about risk management, right? And uh, there's a number of ways to do that. I mean, I, I know you've read the uh, Checklist Manifesto, you know, that terrific okay. book uh, It talks about the role of checklists in terms of reducing risk. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of the appropriate application of checklists to do that. If you could just, a, a visual image is you set up this compliance structure and inside of that, it, it defines an operational envelope, if you will, right? There's some, there's some boundaries to that envelope that are defined by the risk that's entailed uh, in, in those uh, boundaries. And so, you know, your compliance structure is just set up to make sure that you don't cross one of those boundaries. In fact, you want to not only know where those boundaries are, but you probably most definitely want to even give yourself some margin, right, inside those boundaries because, you know, things go wrong. They don't go as planned. You don't want to go right up to the boundary. You want to give yourself plenty of margin. <laughs> and so, uh, so now, so now you've got this uh, envelope to sign or this, you know, this landscape, this, this field on which you can operate inside of that creativity can go, right? You can be as creative as possible. In fact, you want to encourage each other to be as creative as possible, to take full advantage of all of the acreage that exists inside of that uh, risk, that operational envelope. That entails, you know, teaching all of your leaders in particular, but just about everybody, okay, certainly what are the boundaries? Make those very clear including the margin, most effective when you also explain why are those the boundaries, right? What is the, uh, the specific risk involved, the, the risk to whom and for how long, et cetera. And then you, you empower them and you unleash them to operate inside those boundaries. Now, uh, I think that this calcification, this barnacle buildup can happen as uh, you become more risk intolerant over time. Certainly these things can happen over time. And then it can also happen kind of in an, an echelon organization where at the top level, you know, I define my operational envelope and my risk boundaries. The next guy, you know, the next level down, well, they're going to say, hey, I don't even want to get close to there. So I'm going to apply mm-hmm. another, you know, uh, set of margins. And then as it goes on down, by the time you get three or four levels down in the organization, the operational envelope has become so small, it gets <laughs> it gets really hard to be creative inside of that, right? And so this, again, goes to, uh, I think, leader development <laughs> to say, hey, look, let's, let's open this back up. This is the real risk. The barnacles are growing, don't really uh, reduce risk. In fact, they might even increase risk because uh, what will happen as you strike this balance between compliance and creativity, it'll set the cultural tone for your organization, right? And so this is where the decisions that your leaders are making on a day-to-day basis, they're going to be consistent with that organizational culture. And if it's dominated by layers of barnacles that have existed either over time or through layers of the organization or both, uh, well, they're going to be a, mostly a compliance mindset, right? A checklist type of approach to things, even a checklist approach where it's not appropriate, right? You don't want to be doing checklist things in the creative space. So you've got to kind of open it back up and make sure you strike the right balance. You don't want to be uh, foolhardy, right? You don't want to be a cowboy so you get too close to those margins, but you've got to 
you've got to leave enough space for creativity. And that's, I think, you know, that's serious leader. So, so going back to your question, you know, that's something that uh, this, the leader who has delegated so much, that's something that they, they need to monitor very closely because uh, they're going to, they're going to own that culture. And, and so like, what, what would they monitor for? <laughs> like, uh, Hey, I, I'm coming to you, Admiral. And uh, I, I hear the logic of what you're saying, but I'm not even sure what to look for. How would you yeah. advise me in terms of... Uh... Yeah, I, I think that some could be just take a look at the policies, right? So uh-huh. you've got your policies that define the the risk tolerance. And then you know, take a look at the policies that exist out in the other parts of the organization. So, But that, I think, is actually a pretty sterile way to do it. Uh, a much more rich way to do it is to really just have conversations amongst leaders, right? And uh-huh. communicate kind of what, what we call commander's intent, right? And, uh-huh. uh, you know, the team of teams concept is centers on this because, uh, hey, at, at some point, you know, all of the laptops are going to go shut, all the tough books are going to go shut, and you're going to go off and execute. And uh, you've got to have just the most uh, fulsome understanding of the operational envelope all the what ifs and uh, that you might encounter out there so that you can go and, and execute with as much creativity as possible. Can you maybe kind of paint the contrast? I would imagine like if you were to put two leaders in front of you, one of them uh, has a very rigid set of, you know, everyone's uh, managing to the checklist and one is uh, achieving the same sort of compliance objectives, but enabling a higher degree of creativity. I suspect you'll be able to <laughs> spot them you know, very quickly. Can, can you describe what that contrast would look like? It's one of those things that you, you know it when you see it. Well, one, what are they rewarding in their organization? Uh, how are they running their teams, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who are they promoting, uh, rewarding, you know, et cetera? And, and for what? You know, are they striking this balance uh, that is sort of more consistent with the re- compliance creativity balance that you want the organization to espouse? It's not good to get either one out of balance, right? And so um, there's a real reason for this compliance structure that's in place to to make sure you control risk, but you don't want to be dominated by it. You know, there's a saying in the Navy, and it's very true, that a, a ship will take on the personality of its commanding officer. It is It is tangibly noticeable. And so, you know, it's just in the conversations that you have with different people in that organization, you know, sort of right where their set point <laughs> is, but it comes to person to person engagement, you know, and uh, you got to get down there and get that, you know, finger spitting to feel the, the fingertip uh, sense of things. Keen here. I, I am loving so much of what Admiral Richardson brought up, the notion of balancing compliance and creativity. I'll ask him more about that later in the interview, the notion of ships taking on the personality of their commanders. I ask more about that, which leads to some of the most profound insights about leadership that I've heard in a long time. But I just wanted to explore more about the topic of finger gespitzen gefühl. You know, I had heard that term before, but when I looked it up after the interview, uh, there were some surprising nuances that were completely new to me. So on Wikipedia, finger spitzing of fuel is defined literally to mean fingertips feeling, suggesting an intuitive flair or instinct. It describes a great situational awareness and the ability to respond most appropriately and tactfully. It can be applied to diplomats, bearers of bad news, <laughs> or to describe a superior ability to respond to an escalated situation. Uh, the term is sometimes used to describe the instinctive play of certain football players. So it goes on to say there are two contexts in which the word is used. The first is uh, the social context, uh, suggesting tact and diplomacy and a certain amount of sensitivity to the feelings of others, which is a quality that can enable a person to negotiate tricky social situations. But the longer definition is in the military context. In military terminology, it is used for the stated ability for some military commanders to describe, quote, the instinctive and immediate response to battle situations. It is a quality needed to maintain with great accuracy and attention to detail an ever-changing operational and tactical situation by maintaining a mental map of the battlefield. This idiom is intended to evoke a military commander who is in such intimate communication with the battlefield that it is as though he or she has a fingertip on each critical point. Uh, The term is only figurative and cannot itself give a realistic picture of the ability (laughs) being described. It is cognitively related to personal possession of multiple intelligences, notably those pertinent to visual and spatial data processing. The term suggests that in addition to any discursive processing of information that the commander may be conducting, 
such as mentally considering a specific plan. The commander is automatically establishing cognitive relationships between disparate pieces of information as they arrive and is able to immediately resynthesize their mental model of the battlefield. So they give an example of how uh, maps are somewhat static and things that you might put on the map, like men, materials, weapons can change far more rapidly than a cartographer could change a map. And so a commander with fingers, fits, and fuel could hold such a map in their mind and adjust it by incorporating any significant information that was received. So that is not what I actually thought the word meant. I had thought of it as something much more vague like I'll know it when I see it or an intuition. But this definition seems to suggest something far more profound and even uncanny. It seems to suggest an ability to understand what is going on informed by lots of disparate information to adjust that person's mental model of what is actually going on so they can best sense make and respond. That is super cool. And you're going to hear a lot about what Admiral Richardson believes is required to be able to get that uncanny ability to predict the world around you. Okay, back to the interview. Steve, you have, I'm sure you have some thoughts on compliance versus creativity. Oh, yeah, Gene, thanks for asking. So a couple of quick thoughts here is the, uh, the importance that CNO was talking about of having guardrails. We were talking also about uh, things like check, checklists and guardrails. And I think actually guardrails are critically important to allow compliance and creativity. It's not one or the other. If, if I know how I'm supposed to appear to the larger system of which I'm par- a part, then so long as I don't violate those agreements, the guardrails, I can do pretty much anything and be as creative as I want to be just so long as um, I'm compliance with those agreements. And now connecting that to this notion of uh, checklists, you know, in part, what checklists is supposed to tell us is when we're starting to veer towards those guardrails, starting to lose control and uh, start presenting risk. And it's not only risk within our locality, but risk in our relationship to the larger system. And so just one last thought to think about this is it it got entered into the conversation, you know, this idea of uh, flat organizations and whatnot. I mean, not our conversation, but just sort of the dialogue about management, flat organizations. And it never made sense to me because, you know, if I'm working within my guardrails, that's actually liberating. It sounds kind of contradictory. It's liberating because it gives me all this latitude to be creative within the guardrails. If I start veering towards the guardrails, I need help. And if I'm in a flat organization, who the heck do I ask for help? I mean, I need someone who's at, whose job is actually to manage the guardrail and the relationship I have with you so that if I'm going to violate that guardrail or we have to negotiate the guardrail, there's someone there to facilitate that. Uh, you're smiling, John. Maybe can you yeah. maybe verbalize what you're... Yeah, I think we can open up a whole part of this dialogue that talks about leader development and how do you kind of unleash a leader's full capability within that structure. But before we go there, Gene, I also want to also relate that we're talking about people here, right? And so they respond you know, in a very human way. And so how a particular leader might behave as he approaches a guardrail uh, might depend an awful lot on how he was treated the last time he approached it or uh, maybe... <laughs> maybe crossed over it. You know, if it's a very risk intolerant or punitive thing, then he's going to remember that and he's going to apply his own, you know, increased margin. And so you'll see, uh, you know, that that creativity just kind of slowly and slowly suffocate out. And so, you know, there's all sorts of uh, discussions about, hey, are we a, a no fault or zero tolerance type of an organization? It's something, again, that bears a lot of thought between a leader and, and another leader, right? As you were talking about, I loved your phrase, simple, not easy. <laughs> it's, you know, we all strive for simplicity, but there's nothing easy about it. And what, what, when you described kind of the way a set of compliance controls might cascade down, I can't imagine something easier than, you know, if I'm a leader and I have like 100, you know, safety you know, checklists, you know, I'll give 10 to that person, 10 to this person, right? We'll just sort of decompose it down, right? And job done. <laughs> that seems yeah. like a very easy <laughs> way to distribute compliance responsibilities across an organization, but I suspect that does not lead to the best outcomes, right? Because now everyone's managing to the compliance objective versus, you know, really the large objective, you know, of which compliance is in service of. Does that resonate with you? And, and like, how do you, how do you sort of prevent that leader from that mechanical distribution of compliance responsibility to a team, <laughs> right? I'll, I'll yeah. take these 50 and distribute them out. Well, certainly, there is a role for you know, efficient delegation of you know co- these 
parts of the compliance piece are yours, right? But I think uh, to really achieve sort of the maximum performance, particularly, as I said, against a learning and responding adversary or competitor, spend uh, a lot of time on uh, crafting you know, what we would call commander's guidance. But that would be something I always think it should fit on a five by eight card. Very concise. A litmus test for that is, hey, if a leader gets completely separated from headquarters, right, and uh, can't communicate, but you know they're out there. They've got responsibilities. They still have to move the ball downfield, uh, achieve the mission. You know, if they just consult this commander's guidance, they would know what to do to continue to contribute. You know, to the overall team's objectives. There's a lot of, I, I think, supporting assumptions that go with that type of uh, an arrangement. So, for instance, okay, where is my risk tolerance? Right, I'm going to delegate this risk to you. That's yours to control. Uh, but if you go outside those boundaries, we got to talk, right? So, there's a, there's not only you know commander's guidance, command, but there's also feedback, right? And so, you know, I'm sending you, I, I'm sending a, a, a teammate out to achieve this objective and you know, a remote part of the organization. And you can think about remote in a lot of ways. It doesn't have to be geographic. And, you know, you, you own that, right? And, and here's the set of assumptions that go along with that. You know, an understanding of the guardrails, as Steve put it, uh, understanding of uh, our best characterization of the environment. You know, that's that's all part of it. If you go out there and it doesn't look anything like that, you know, <laughs> Call me up, right? Because we got problems, and so there's this kind of command and feedback in uh, in the structure, and so it really does, you know, kind of really uh, depend on a dialogue between leaders, and that forms the basis for those times when, hey, if a leader does get separated or out of communication, they've got all of that to draw on, all of that context. And they can continue to to move uh, forward, contribute to uh, the mission until they get you know back in communication. Mm-hmm. So, and I've heard you say the goal is to reconnect with the first principles of the organization with energy, enthusiasm to unleash you know creativity. Is that embodied in the five by eight card? Is that sort of in the in the backup material? Like, uh, yeah. how does uh, where does that fit in? I think a lot of that goes in your uh, leader development program. Right, because that's some serious foundational work, and so the uh, five by eight, I think, would be a little bit more mission dependent, right? So, hey, given that you've kind of been brought up as a leader in this organization, and we have uh, done the genetic engineering to instill you with our culture, instill you with our values, we've set that balance between compliance and creativity. All of that is foundational work, right? And those are the confidence building measures that uh, allow leaders to have that trust and confidence in one another that each is going to do what they need to do, right, for the good of the team. And so uh, then, you know, the five by eight is, hey, this is our mission. (laughs) Given that foundation, you know, as to how we're going to go about doing things, this is what we want to do. So, you know, by all means, here are the things that uh, are good to do. And you might want to flip it over and say, hey, please don't do these things, right? It just (laughs) won't be helpful. So uh, I think it's sort of, you know, the investment you make in leader development is really important in terms of defining that culture in people, you know, and then based on the trust and confidence that is instilled by virtue of that program, you can then give them the commander's guidance for this mission. They go off and do it. So interesting. And you said one thing that really caught my attention is uh, you observe the behaviors of what happens when someone strays too close to the boundary or crosses it, right? You said that the, how that leader will behave in that situation is often dependent on what happened the last time he or she <laughs> was there, right? Where they, I can imagine some situations, right? It's, uh, they get written up. They get punished, right? Yes. Uh, um, and might not be for violating a rule. It just be it might might be violating a norm. It's like stay in your lane. <laughs> it's my right. lane, not yours. <laughs> Versus um, one that leads to a far more constructive, maybe generative something where it's like, oh my goodness, we that's actually a terrible rule. Let's revisit whether that rule should exist. Can you, uh, does that resonate with you in terms of like um, what you meant by what happened last time? Yeah, or what I was actually thinking of, Gene, was more th- things like near misses. Right. Oh. And so you've got this uh, episode that happens where you know, there was a there was a breakdown and uh, it was all the ingredients for a catastrophe were there. It's just that, you know, you got lucky that day. 
And instead yeah. of, you know, actually colliding or whatever, you pass close by. But, you know, what happens then, right? And uh, I think uh, a thoughtful leader would want to say, hey, we, we were just lucky there. We were completely in the regime of luck. Uh, let's get everybody in. I'm gonna, we're going to do a full scrub of this to find out how it broke down because the, the entire sequence of events was there. So I think that that would be a very productive way of, you know, that leader is going to be smarter, more capable, experienced. His team is going to be sharper. Her team is going to be sharper the next time uh, versus, okay, that was that was just too close. You know, I'm done with you and uh, let's find somebody else. So there are, <laughs> there, are le- there are lessons to be learned in these. And, uh, right. and But, you know, sometimes they say, hey, are you a zero tolerance organization or a, a zero defect organization i say well that depends on the defect you know and right. and sometimes it is one of those things that uh hey, the communication has been clear particularly in the value structure or something like that you know mm. uh, it's like hey it, it's sort of I'm, I'm sorry but one strike and you're out on this one so yeah, you know, uh, maybe if I can paint the counter of that in the, in the Unicorn Project, there was actually a scene that was actually based on uh, a real life example that came from Heather Mickman. She was the senior director of development at Target. <laughs> so I got to follow around for three days, and I got to see many interesting things. But by far the most interesting thing I saw was the certificate that was on her desk, and it uh, was looked like it was printed on an inkjet printer. <laughs> it was actually in PowerPoint, right? And it said "Lifetime Achievement Award given to Heather O'Sullivan Mickman for." Uh, abolishing TEP and LARB. <laughs> so TEP is the technology evaluation process. LEAD is the LEAD Architecture Review Board. <laughs> so the right. uh, the reason why that's relevant is whenever you want to do something new, you have to write up a TEP form, pitch the LARB meeting, and then they had all the ops and security architects on one table, the dev and enterprise architects at the other table. They would pepper you with questions, start arguing with each other, reassign you 40 more questions, and say, hey, come back next month, and we will reevaluate your idea. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the point of the story is that she said, none of my... 180 engineers should go through this. None of the 2,000 engineers at Target should ever have to go through this. Why is this process, why is this structure here? And she said, no one could really remember. There was some vague memory of something disastrous happening 20 years ago, but what exactly that disaster was has been lost in the midst of time, but the process (laughs) still remained. And I I, I suspect that you would uh, say this is an example of a barnacle that has lodged itself in the organization that now shaped the way that people act. Does that resonate with you? And and if Heather had come to you back then, like what would be some directive advice? Oh, by the way, just say they actually got the certificate because they did abolish the process due to her endless lobbying. So maybe you can just react to that story. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations, you know, and who would want to be part of a process, anything called LARB, you know, I mean, it's just <laughs> of all the acronyms. But the other response often, Gene, is uh, of the organization is someone gets too close to a guardrail to just continue to use Steve's very uh, good description. So there might be something that happened to that person, right? Uh, that's going to make that uh, he or she just more conservative. But then the, the system, the organization may respond and say, "Hey, we don't want anybody to get that close again. So we're going to create, you know, the following margin. They're going to build in right. increased margin, which just sort of closes down on that creative space, as we talked about before. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, over the passage of time. Oh, by the <laughs> way there'll be another thing that happens. And so another barnacle will be placed on top of that one. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you can do, Gene, is uh, put in another layer of supervision, right? Right. And so, you know, an an operator might make a mistake. And uh, so, okay, now I'm going to put in a supervisor. And then, you know, that system makes a mistake. And so you put another, you know, super supervisor over it. And uh, what emerges is kind of this uh, implicit shared responsibility where the operator says, well, I've got two layers of supervision, you know, how much do I really have to be focused on this? And and the supervisors are saying, well, this operator's trained on that, so, uh, you know, this should be pretty easy. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, nobody's really paying attention to the business and uh, problems emerge, so. And, and can you maybe give a, an example, uh, whether abst- concrete or abstract? <laughs> like, yeah. Well, how do you sort of address the fear of, like, taking out those layers of control, right? It's like, to make that person fully responsible for their well, I mean, I was a submariner for most of my career, and the submariners, submarines do their business submerged. So we only surface when we have to go in and out of port. And uh, and so we do all of those things that come with uh, driving a ship around 
on the surface. And one of those, you know, but a lot of that gear, uh, a radar, for instance, right? We don't use <laughs> radars very often. And so it's a skill set we have to continue to train on because we don't get a lot of operational experience. And so oftentimes, you know, as I would move around uh, when I commanded the submarine force, you would see this exact dynamic emerge. There's a radar operator, then there's a radar supervisor, then there was a, you know, uh, a senior supervisor <laughs> over the whole thing. I was like, why do we need three people to operate the radar, right? And so uh, it goes back to, does that radar operator really get the sense that he he or she owns that, that part of the business, right? Have they won uh, the expertise, right? There's kind of four ingredients for ownership as we kind of boiled it down. One is you got to know what you're doing. So you have to, no kidding, be an expert at what you're doing. And then we're very familiar with sort of responsibility. You're going to be responsible for that. And oh, by the way, you'll you'll be accountable for that. And then, you know, finally, a lot of times, particularly in the delegation business, you know, have you really given that uh, leader the full authority they need to do to, to own the task, right? Because very frustrating when you perhaps you're responsible and accountable for something, but you don't have the authority to do it your way, right? And so that that just creates, uh, or you're put in a position where you don't have sufficient experience and expertise, and no matter how enthusiastic you are, you just wouldn't recognize right from wrong, you know, because you just don't have the training. So, so it's like okay, let's let's get this uh, person, this radar operator, trained up, and she can. It's, it's not above her capabilities and make it clear that we're all relying on her and, uh, and she'll do terrific. And that's what you, you almost always what happened. I hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as I am. I absolutely love Admiral John Richardson's view of leadership and it's been amazing to see how frequently his work has been studied and referenced within the technology community inside the U.S. Department of Defense. We are well underway in creating our 2021 Virtual DevOps Enterprise Summit Europe event with the goal of making it our best programming ever. One of the announced speakers is Dr. Ron Westrom, whose work is so familiar to so many of us within the DevOps Enterprise community. This virtual conference will be held on May 18th to the 20th. Go to events.itrevolution.com slash virtual and use the code IDEALCAST to get $150 off your registration. And you may have noticed that the DevOps Enterprise video library has been loaded with new content. Behind the scenes, we've been working to add all the talks from all our previous conferences. This is nearly a thousand talks dating all the way back to 2014. We're publishing them in batches, so check back in weekly to see what's new. To test it out, try searching for Dr. Andre Martin. His incredibly popular session from Las Vegas 2019 hasn't been released to the public until now. Go to video library, doesvirtual.com to access it. One of the things that I got to work on was a state of DevOps research. So this is with um, a colleague, Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humboldt. It was this cross-population study of 36,000 respondents over six years. And you know, we learned what high performance looks like, and we learned what you know not high performance uh, looked like, and we could actually correlate and even predict kind of what behaviors, what architectural attributes, what cultural att- attributes led to high performance. One of the neatest findings was that having uh, to get approvals from distant approval boards <laughs> made every metric go the wrong way. And I yeah. think it was just these lovely things that really show when responsibility is shared across too broad of a surface area, <laughs> like uh, the, the you never get the results that you want. I'm guessing that resonates with your own experience. That's experiences. exactly it. You know, Admiral Rickover used to say, if I didn't have a name and a phone number... I didn't really have somebody (laughs) responsible, right? That you could call up and say, you know, what is going on? It's it's not a bad analogy. Holy cow, that story of a submarine operator having two levels of supervision because of the infrequent opportunities to practice on a submarine (laughs) is so amazing. I think Admiral Richardson's story of being able to safely remove those levels of supervision and increase effectiveness and efficiency and safety is fabulous. Uh, The four elements that he talked about were expertise, responsibility, accountability, and authority. I am sure that story resonates with everyone in the technology community. Adrian Cockcroft, famous for his work at Sun, at eBay, Netflix, and now at AWS, he talked about the phenomena of scar tissue. 
I'll put a link to a post about one of the talks he did where he explains product development processes are built on this assumption that if you have really good processes, you won't have any problems. And then when something goes wrong, you have a process step and a check to prevent it from going wrong again. The problem is that each time something goes wrong, you add one more process step and your processes get longer and longer and slower and slower. And you build up something that he calls scar tissue processes. He says a similar situation occurs when you look at HR manuals. They are the result of everything anyone's ever done wrong in that company. The unfortunate result can be that over time, the organization can end up with so many rules that individuals can hardly keep track of them, let alone remain in compliance. And the effort to avoid problems becomes counterproductive as it creates complex new ones. And so, of course, he describes how the product delivery process can get similarly bogged down. And really, this is a story that I wanted to tell in the Unicorn Project, where what was once maybe a vibrant center of technology creativity has collapsed in on itself due to burdensome rules <laughs> where it has become impossible for anyone to get anything done. Adrian speaks so eloquently and persuasively about how one has to strip these scar tissue processes out in order to increase product delivery speed, and the solution is an innovation process like continuous delivery. I couldn't find the exact reference for this, but I think it was Adrian Cockcroft who also said in so many organizations, especially when IT is a cost center, they have to get signed off for spending more than, say, $500. And yet those are exactly the same organizations that will put 15 highly paid engineers in a room together to approve changes. And according to the meeting cost calculator, those 15 people at a salary of, say, $150,000 a year, that one hour meeting just cost $1,200. <laughs> so, all right, back to the interview. When you said that every ship inherits the personality of their commanding officer, I mean, wouldn't it be easier if that weren't true? Do you ever <laughs> find yourself wanting, like, just for your sanity, that there were more uniformity across <laughs> your captains? Uh, or is that naive and wrongheaded? <laughs> well, I think, Gene, this is what actually where you and I could have a great conversation about the Unicorn Project and all of that, <laughs> because I think it's an unavoidable human dimension to uh, leadership, you know? It's just whether we like it or not, it's going to happen. And uh, sometimes there's this sense of, uh, in, in fact, we chatted about it a little bit before. Okay, you put these, uh, you, you put this culture in place and you've got this approach to doing business as a leader and then, you know, you move on. You, you're succeeded by another leader. How do you prevent from sliding back maybe into, uh, you know, something that where that balance between compliance and creativity is out of whack? It's very difficult because that new leader is going to come in and they're going to they're going to put their imprint on that organization, right? And they're going to create that balance. And so, you know, underneath that, the deep currents, you would hope, particularly if you're taking an enterprise approach to leader development and all of those things, those deep currents will still be in place. Uh, but within that, you know, there's going to be some variation just due to the leader that you put in charge. That's why you want to kind of have this constant dialogue between <laughs> leaders, right? Uh, just so you've got, hey, where are you here on this uh, plus minus? You know, you stay in, in, in a place that's good, allows you to lead, right? Because that's, that's really a lot of fun, very rewarding and inspiring. So you don't want to stifle that. But neither yeah. do you want it to go high and right. You know, you've got a responsibility to monitor that as well. So, and, and this may seem like a hopelessly naive question, but I, I mean, on a scale of one to ten, that human element, and maybe just from your most theoretical perspective, you know, liberate yourself from the headaches of what this entails. How important is that idiosyncratic? human part of leadership one is it's, it's all downside <laughs> right i want uniformity yeah. and i want yeah. consistency and it's like oh no it is the best leaders who actually need to exploit you know the dynamic range of people and their unique skills like wh where do you kind of what does your intuition say about I that would, uh, i'm going to use that classic uh, answer is that it depends a little bit and uh <laughs> so you know the navy is a leadership factory right? The armed services are. And, uh, you know, just to use the Navy example, a sailor just barely figures out where his rack is or her rack is on the ship, their bed, just gets uh, comfortable. And before you know it, she's put in a leadership position, right? Because it's just the way the system works. I would say that uh, the human element of this uh, starts at like a seven in terms of importance for a junior leader and mm -hmm. goes to a 10, uh, for more senior leaders. Now, you, you know, for a junior leader, a lot of those 
uh, small team things are going to be, one, getting a firm command of those guardrails, right, that we talked about, right? So you really have to inculcate those. And, and, and that operational envelope for those more junior personnel is going to be necessarily smaller, Right, because uh, but as they get comfortable and demonstrate creativity and and respect for the the guardrails, you're going to expand that and expand that and give them more and more room to be creative, and so that becomes uh, a, a bigger and bigger part of the equation, uh, such that I think at the certainly at the CEO level, it's almost all about the human relationships and the trust and confidence that you you uh, sh- share with one another. That's the difference maker. You know, be, huh. you can assume a lot of expertise that they know their business, et cetera, right? I don't think they would have been made the CEO if they didn't. But what are the, what are the real difference makers? It's the, it's the human element. Interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, forgive the army <laughs> example, but there was a lot written on, you know, just how much leeway uh, General Patton was given <laughs> what, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, whether he could get away with things that other people couldn't. And uh, there's a narrative that says Eisenhower uh, deliberately protected him because he was saving him for, you know, a certain phase in the, the invasion of Europe. I mean, it sounds like that is an example of where you, when you're really choosing the right person for the right job, that that was yeah. an example of why it's so critical, why it's a 10, right, as opposed to a 1. You need to find be able to find those uniquely gifted people f- for these unique jobs. Am I uh, understanding that correctly? Yeah, Steve, uh, y- you can uh, share your thoughts, but I think absolutely right, Gene. You're going to give that person a tremendous amount of responsibility, a tremendous part of the success of the whole team, right? Maybe even the critical part. And, right. <laughs> uh, and so you know, choosing the right person for that, it, that's the asymmetric advantage, uh, the thing that'll that'll get you the result that you need. That, yeah, that's a lot of people have different approaches to this gene. Obviously, mm-hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a debate, and uh, we could talk about this all day. But that's kind of the approach I'd like to I, I like to take. Yeah. Steve, awesome. I don't know what your thoughts are. What you're saying here uh, certainly resonates with a conversation Gene and I have been having for the last couple of months about. Um, thinking through the structure of an organization so it gets the right dynamics. I think there's a assumption, you know, people who, as they get into leader positions, they don't have to worry about the details anymore. You know, I just have a, I have to create a vision. I have to be creative in creating a vision and let other people carry it out. The, the, the problem with that is that achieving the vision requires a lot of pieces coming together in just the right way. You know, to the example of uh, General Patton or anyone else who's sort of got, let's say, an idiosyncratic personality but well-suited to a particular thing, if you don't have a, a good vision of what your system is, you'll never know where you're saving that, what you're saving that person for. And so then you run a risk of you put them in doing exactly the wrong thing. And a guy like Patton really could have been destructive, I suppose, in that. Or when the opportunity presents itself, you just don't know. And so I guess pulling this together, this apparent tension between um, control and creativity, uh, I'm going to keep coming back to it's control for creativity. Yeah. That by having clarity, you liberate people to actually be creative. I mean, where you can't be creative is in, in an environment of confusion because you have no, no idea what the heck is going on and why it's going on and you have no sense of cause and effect or action and outcome or consequence. How can you be creative? It's just random. But when you have clarity around you, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now, now, I, now I, can, I can see what, where I can go. And... Um, when I try something, I can see the consequence. Yeah, we used to uh, we like to use uh, the uh, jazz musician analogy, you know, to just get after what Steve just described. And so, you know, the first of all, you know, those titans of jazz music, uh, of course, they uh, are just have worked so much on the technical aspects of uh, playing their instrument, and they're masters. And then uh, even the music they play, you know, it's got a key signature, it's got a chord structure, it's got, you know, all of those things. Inside that is where the creativity happens, and they can riff and do all of that. So it's creating beauty within these constraints that <laughs> is uh, the genius of leadership, I think. If I can just, again, pause for a moment. I So I'm... Maybe I can articulate why my my cheeks hurt right now because I've been smiling so much. <laughs> uh, I, I love that. Uh, I'm I'm absolutely loving the. I'm learning a ton, John, and I, I think there's a there's a precision and a specificity when you talk about leadership that make me very envious of people who were able to serve and get trained in this because I think there's a there's a clarity of thinking 
that is just evident and enviable. So I, I just want to expose that <laughs> so I can maybe, uh, for what it's worth, I, I'm, uh, this is amazing. I was taught well. <laughs> I learned all this from my mentors. So and Steve is one of them. So it's all uh, it's all a great group to be in company with. Gene here. I love that. Creating beauty or greatness within constraints is part of the genius of leadership. <laughs> that portion of this interview has led to one of the top aha moments of leadership that I've had because it reveals what is required to create shared consciousness, which was written about so much in Team of Teams or or Finger, Spitz, and Gefühl, which was discussed earlier. I spoke with Dr. Steve Spear earlier today about that topic, and I'll share with you later where I think this fits into our notion of structure and dynamics. But the reason for this break-in is to explain that story behind General Eisenhower and General Patton. I am reading from a couple of Wikipedia entries. One is about the film Patton, a 1970 film, which was written by Francis Ford Coppola. So during World War II, General Eisenhower is the five-star general serving as the supreme commander of the Allied forces in Europe. And the five-star rank only exists during wartime. If I remember correctly, General Patton has a series of successes when he takes over the Second Corps in North Africa, defeating the plans of the famous German General Erwin Rommel. Patton had already developed a reputation in the U.S. Army as an effective, successful, and hard-driving commander. He often had a larger-than-life personality. He became known for his flashy dress, highly polished helmets and boots, and a no-nonsense demeanor. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the commander of the Sicily Operation and Patton's friend and commanding officer, had long known of Patton's colorful leadership style and also knew that Patton was prone to impulsive and a lack of self-restraint. While on a visit to a field hospital, Patton notices a shell-shocked soldier crying, calling him a coward. Patton slaps the soldier and even threatens to shoot him before demanding his immediate return to the front line. By Eisenhower's order, Patton is relieved of command and required to apologize to the soldier, to others present, and to his entire command. I'm reading the Wikipedia entry on George S. Patton's slapping incidents, and there is pages and pages about the reprimands. There's considerable media attention, with citizens rightly outraged that their sons that they're sending to war could be treated this way. Within a month, Eisenhower orders Patton's 7th Army to be broken up, with a few of its units remaining garrisoned in Sicily. In a letter, Eisenhower tells Patton he had been informed of the slapping incidents. He would not be opening a formal investigation to the matter, but his criticism of Patton was sharp. He writes, I clearly understand that firm and drastic measures are at times necessary in order to secure the desired objectives, but this does not excuse brutality, abuse of the sick, nor exhibition of uncontrollable temper in front of subordinates. I feel that the personal services you have rendered the United States and the Allied cause during the past weeks are of incalculable value, but nevertheless, if there is considerable element of truth in the allegations accompanying this letter, I must so seriously question your good judgment and your self-discipline as to raise serious doubts in my mind as to your future usefulness. So uh, those are some pretty stern words from Eisenhower to Patton. So here's a letter from Eisenhower to his boss, General George Marshall, on August 24th. Eisenhower praises Patton's exploits as a commander of the 7th Army and his conduct of the Sicily campaign particularly his ability to take initiative as a commander. So later in this article, I'm reading, Contrary to his statements to Patton, Eisenhower never seriously considered removing the general from duty in the European theater. Patton did not command a force in combat for 11 months. Exploiting Patton's situation, Eisenhower sends him on several high-profile trips throughout the Mediterranean in late 1943. By the next year, the German high command still had more respect for Patton than any other Allied commander and considers him central to any plan to invade Europe from the north. Eisenhower wrote, Patton is indispensable to the war effort, one of the guarantors of our victory. I'm certainly no expert in military history. I did my best to stitch together the story from scanning a bunch of Wikipedia pages. The best book about this is a book called The Generals, American Military Command from World War II to Today by Thomas E. Ricks. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I'm hoping that will give you some useful context behind the story of Eisenhower and Patton that was mentioned. Okay, before we jump back into the interview, I want to set some context for the next question. So here's the background. For almost 35 years, I have been wondering about the nature of the different career tracks in the military. You have the enlisted and non-commissioned officer track, you have the officer track, and more recently, warrant officers. And I've been trying to understand where among these 
do software competencies need to be integrated? Here's Steve giving some additional context, specifically around the three layers of where creativity can be applied. So you'll be hearing about these three layers in future episodes, but very briefly, layer one is where work is performed. So that is the object being designed, created, formed, processed, improved, etc. So that could be the work of the developer, the intelligence analyst, the biologist working on a vaccine, the designer, the machine operator, the submariner, the Navy SEAL. Layer two is the equipment and instrumentation through which creativity is expressed. So this could be the IDE, the code editor, the CAD layout tools, the lab bench, the lathe, the heat treat oven, the sonar, the communications and controls and armaments. And then layer three are the processes for which we integrate the pieces into a harmonized whole. And that incorporates the system level goals, the structure and architecture, the interfaces, in other words, the sanctioned ways that those component pieces can communicate with each other, and the work methods. So among those three layers, among those three tracks within the military, where does the software competency fit? So here's Steve setting some of that context. You know, our, our side conversation, which uh, has been entirely speculative and data-free about this uh, the career track for enlisted versus officers. Maybe I can offer some background now. Where Gene and I have been talking is uh, around this idea that um, the processes of an organization that we can bring individual contribution towards some harmonized collective purpose. I guess the first thing is the reason we form organizations is because we have problems to solve collectively that we can't solve individually. And, And by and large, the problems we have to solve are intellectual problems, not physical problems. I mean, yes, you know, I can't carry a sofa by myself, but most of what we do is, and, and Gene, just as an aside, I was talking to someone earlier today, you know, you think about David Silverman's account of creating the, um, the flow through team of teams. You know, I started mapping out the process flow for what he was describing. So there's um, the upfront violence by rangers to collect things. And at the end, there's the downstream violence by, um, let's say, SEALs to act on what's... But everything in between those two violent acts is is intellectual process. You know, turning what the rangers recovered and turning into a better understanding of uh, what to do and where to do it and how to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And then it gets released through this uh, managed, controlled use of of, of violence. Everything in between is an intellectual uh, conversion. Anyway... Sorry for that aside. So, you know, Gene and I have been talking about you create organizations that solve problems, most of which are intellectual. Um, they're big problems, which is why we organize, because we can't solve them by ourselves. And uh, then we start talking about the, the layers at which people are creative. And um, we've been test driving this idea. The object in front of us where we exhibit creativity, there's the instrument, instrumentation we use to act on the object, and then there's the creativity at the um, organizational level to uh, design and redesign the processes. So anyway, that, that, that's sort of a setup. So when Gene lobs his question at you, yeah. we were kind of speculating in the, uh, in the military, is it in part that the enlisted ranks are trained to have great expertise about layers one and two? You know, the, the technical things and, and, and the way in which you use whatever the available instrumentation is to act on whatever that object is. And that a, a big part of what... Um, the officer corps has to learn, and again, there's obviously overlap and whatnot, but a big part of what they have to learn is that third layer about how to manage the enterprise to make sure the pieces are constantly coming together well. Mm-hmm. So that, that was a hypothesis we were generating. And maybe to put some words on kind of what yeah. that layer three is, the you know, the goal, <laughs> architecture, structure, work methods, right? Kind of defining how teams interact. So the thesis is that's entirely in this third layer. So uh, one of the things that Steve and I are working on is creating this very parsimony set of constructs to explain why organizations work the way they do, both in the ideal and the not ideal. The three constructs are dominant architectures. They're great at doing what, they're, what they've been designed for, effective, efficient, and they're resistant to change. So, uh, John, I think this is like, you know, uh, kind of the barnacles <laughs> can, can accumulate yeah. there. Structure are the way you set up the teams. Uh, what are the sanctioned ways for the components to talk to each other? And the software, it's the architecture they work within. And then dynamics is everything else. The tone set by the leaders, you know, the culture that amplifies signals, <laughs> uh, amplifies weak signals, or one that extinguishes or suppresses them entirely. And so this, an area of structure, and this is a question I'm not overstating, that I've been dragging around in my head for 35 years, is one that you see in the military where you have one track for officers, another for enlisted personnel and NCOs, and then more recently for warrant officers. 
I, I'd be so grateful if you could just even describe why it's important to have these independent career tracks and dis- and from your perspective, the importance of this officer NCO partnership from a couple of levels. You know, I think the you know, at the O one level, O six, and you know, what does it even look like at the more senior ranks? You know, say O nine yeah. and above. Some of it, to be honest, uh, Gene, is is sort of left over, right, from approaches that have come before us. So you mentioned patent. You know, a lot of the personnel system was uh, built to inculcate, you know, a massive force, train them as quickly as possible to be sort of nominally effective, and then. Uh, get them out there, and then, you know, they'll learn on the job. And so, you know, as we started to think about uh, leader development, uh, to be honest, with the exception of the actual kind of the schools, the, the structures, if you will, there wasn't any difference in the approach, right? Uh, and so we sort of blended them together in our leader development framework. And uh, the idea was that first and foremost, we have to say, hey, in the Navy context, you know, what are we trying to make, right? If we're going to make a le- what what qualities does that leader have to uh, you know, uh, have before uh, she or he is uh, effective, right? So there's the goal. And then uh, as we learn to think about, okay, how do we you know, take a person from wherever they are, anywhere in the nation, actually literally anywhere in the world, bringing all of that variety to an induction point, whether that's a uh, boot camp for enlisted or some ROTC program or the Naval Academy, whatever it is for officers, o- OCS. And, uh, and now, you know, th- now the sailorization begins, right? Where we take these people and, and, uh, and bring them into some sort of common understanding. So how do we, how do we now organize ourselves to, uh, uh, go down that road? Well, we said that there's sort of, there's sort of three lanes, uh, to go down. One is we've got to teach them the skills, the competent skills to do their job, right? So if you're going to be a radar operator, since we uh, have talked about those, we got to teach you all about radars, right? We got to teach you how they work, uh, what are the principles, and then how does this particular radar work? And uh, so there's the competence part. We also found, uh, particularly as we started to get into a more radical delegation, that it was important to uh, train on character, you know, it was really important that uh, as we gave someone a mission and then delegated them a, a, a bunch of authority and and sent them off to uh, do something important, we could be confident that we share the same value structure, right? And 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 we found, to be honest, that a lot of our problems were it were not so much competence based but character based, and so particularly for an all volunteer force in which the People of the United States have tremendous trust and confidence. Uh, they're going to send their sons and daughters to go be part of this. They want leaders who are people of character. And so we we stood that, uh, that lane up. And then it came to me relatively late in my time as CNO, but uh, another lane, another dimension was this idea of what we call connections or community, right? And uh, so how are these leaders... How skilled are they in connecting to one another, both professionally, but also uh, what we found emotionally, right? So everybody is going to have, at some point, a really terrible day, right? And uh, how resilient are they to absorbing that bad day, that bad result, learning everything they can, getting their mojo back, and then you know getting back on, on the horse, if you will. A lot of that uh, comes from the emotional and, uh, and, and professional support you get from your connections, right? And so there's a lot of resilience and strength that comes through that. I will tell you that uh, late in my time as CNO, I went to visit another uh, very senior leader in the Navy, right? Kind of sort of a three-star level, a tremendous uh, amount of responsibility, for this person. And, uh, it was one of these, uh, visits where I hadn't, you know, I, I didn't really say anything about why I was coming. I just wanted to talk with this person. So there was, you know, I didn't say, Hey, show me this, or I want to see about this. So, uh, you know, we arrived at the headquarters and we had a very nice greeting party, you know, that met us there. And we went in and said hello to everybody. And then, you know, a lot of people kind of fall off as you get to closer to the office and you're in the C-suite, if you will. And then finally, you know, those people fall off and it's just this leader and me, 
right? And he said, you know, hey, you didn't really give us a whole lot about why you're visiting here. What, what do you want to hear about? And I said, well, I really just want to hear what you, uh, what's on your mind, right? What do you want to talk about? I, I really just want to get a sense of that. Now, this person had a tremendous amount going on in their area of responsibility. And of all of those things, kind of given this freedom to, to pick and choose what to talk about, this person said, you know, I'll tell you what, it, it gets very lonely sometimes. And that is true. You know, they, there's that saying, it's lonely at the top. But, you know, until you've been there and you kind of feel that, uh, you don't really, uh, uh, you, you might not fully understand the impact that has on that. So I had this kind of connections idea floating around and I uh, was wondering, well, is it worthy of, you know, another edition, ver- you know, another version? <laughs> and as soon as I heard, and, and it was actually a very creative person with which I had become acquainted with, you know, she had kind of advised me, hey, I read your your uh, version one, and I think that you're missing something in this connections idea. And she was very compelling in terms of, uh, you know, outlining that. As soon as I heard that conversation about loneliness, I said, okay, this is what we've got to do. And so we started uh, putting a lot more emphasis on, even at, so let's say, the three-star level, You know, one of the important dimensions of leadership is how well you're connected with your fellow three-stars. They're like great white sharks, right? They, they're they huge. They, they have a, a big part of the ocean to themselves. You know, That's just the nature of it. But still, using technology and, and everything, how do they connect, share lessons, share stories, and uh, and support one another professionally and emotionally. So so those are the three lanes, right? And then uh, how do you move down those lanes? Well, there's formal schools, and we have a, a bunch of those. Then there's on-the-job training, and we have a lot of that, formal qualifications, uh, watch standard qualifications, et cetera. And then there's uh, self-learning. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Eisenhower and Patton, you know, both of those uh, tremendous self-learners, right? The voracious readers. Those were the kind of the three motive forces to move down this road, this three-lane road, to get to this objective of building the leader that we wanted to build. And that's kind of how we structured it. So uh, that's another thing I'll send you, Gene, is the leader development framework. And you can kind of read how we put all that down. Sorry, there's like tears of joy <laughs> again, dripping to <laughs> <in> my cheeks. <laughs> you know, you know, and I, one of the things that uh, Steve said once to me, he said, you know, if you take a look at the current leadership ranks, at the senior leadership ranks, these are the people who won the tournament of the last century, kind of the, the 20th century rules of what uh, we thought leadership was about, and they might be very unprepared for, you know, this, and, and so when you talk about these things that were obviously very important to you, things like, you know, how, how does uh, leaders have a community that can support them, <laughs> right? Uh, right? Do you ever feel like if you were to talk to your predecessor 100 years ago and you had shared this, that you would get laughed at by them, that it would be so alien to them? Or do you think these were, you know, if you look in the right texts, you, know, you would find evidence of this in the people that are held in such high regard in the naval community? I think you would uh, find that it was much richer back then than perhaps it is right now. You know, really? Uh, yeah. I mean, the conversations they had, the letters they wrote back and forth. You know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Patton. I think it was Patton who I- I'll get this a little bit off, but not too far off. You know, the orders that he got was you know basically go to Europe, <laughs> conquer same. You know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that was about, you know, it. and, uh, you know, they knew each other so well because they had, gr- you know, grown up together and they, and they were, you know, because the stakes were so high, they had to be very honest in terms of confronting each other's strengths and weaknesses. And, uh, so I think that you would find that it was richer in terms of the interpersonal, uh, part back then. And technology is actually, serve to make it more antiseptic right now than it was. So we have to fight to uh, not become, you know, a Facebook friend, but just a real friend to that person, uh, complete with all of the uh, strengths and weaknesses, the vulnerabilities, and and everything that come with that. Is is there an easy answer for why that's happened? When do you think that phenomena, that dynamic, was reduced. I mean, in fifty years ago, thirty years ago, what, what is there an easy explanation for why that happened? I, I only have kind of my intuitive answer to that, yeah. Gene, and it's not backed up by any uh, research at all. I think that the rise of social media has 
So I'll, I'll give you an example in kind of personal technology, I, I would say, beyond just social media. But so uh, when I first was in the submarine force, I was a junior officer, and one of my collateral duties was the movie officer, right? <laughs> and uh, it was super important you know, because we go to sea for a long time. We had movies that were actually on these big reels, right? So you would get these movies down, and there would be three or four reels. You'd get maybe a dozen movies for an incredibly long time. So you better make them good, right? And so the movie officer was a, a high risk, high consequence <laughs> job. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I remember getting chewed up by my first uh, CEO, uh, Captain Pete Graff, who is just a terrific guy. He basically said, Richardson, if you get me one more movie with Swamp in the title, you know, I am going to kick you <laughs> off the ship, right? So, <laughs> because uh, what we would do is then, you know, the, the crew would get together in the cruise mess and uh, they would put these reels on a projector and, and pull down a screen and everybody would get together and watch these. There was one deployment I made, you know, six month deployment, almost all of it submerged. Every night we watched the movie Tombstone, right? I mean, every single night we watched that one movie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we could quote that movie verbatim, end to end, but it was the gathering together really, that gave everybody that chance to just enjoy that camaraderie, all the support, all of the ribbing, all of the, you know, the stuff that goes along with that. Fast forward, you know, maybe even 10 years. Now, uh, well, there's no more reels anymore. They're all on DVDs. And uh, everybody's got a DVD player. So when they come back, uh, when they come on board and load out their personal, you know, load out for deployment... They bring their player and one of those DVD, you know, books. And instead of gathering in the cruise mess, uh, they're more prone to just go to their rack and they can turn on this thing, put on a set of headphones. And it's a very individual, perhaps isolated experience. And so I think that there's, you know, something to this. Uh, and I think that the pendulum will swing back, Gene. You know, I'm just confident mm -hmm. that we're getting a greater awareness of this. And uh, we'll learn to really capture the best of all worlds. Yeah. But I think that uh, I think that this personalization of technology and you know perhaps even social media has served uh, to kind of have an opposite effect than uh, it was intended and and isolates people rather than brings them together. I love uh, the work of Tim Ferriss because he loves studying outliers. So you know when he wants to study weight loss, right? He stands as, he studies cancer survivors <laughs> and like uh, you know Olympic athletes. <laughs> because you end up with these kind of, uh, you know, some strange learnings can come from, you know, these data points, you know, three, four standard deviations away from the norm. <laughs> yeah, limiting cases. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And maybe just help me connect the dots. I mean, so I can imagine that happening at the submarine unit level, but how, how what, were, what were the rituals or that were lost kind of at the, you know, senior ranks? So what were the, what, what are the missing rituals that, normally would have uh, created those relationships or you know, uh, nurtured those relationships. Yeah, well, I, I think it all builds on itself, right? So uh, those shared experiences, yeah. you know, it kind of goes again to leader development. Oh. <laughs> those shared experiences that they had, maybe by serving on the same command, but even if they didn't, you know, it was happening across, across the army or across the fleet or whatever right. it was. And then... Uh, and, you know, they would be in a, a particular class together, you know, and so, and that would be a relationship that yeah. would last. And so there's really, you know, to your point, there's nothing that prevents us from doing that now, right? Yeah. It's just somehow there's been a drift, it seems. Right, right. I can, I can sort of see that here's all the social interactions that would have normally happened that are now missing <laughs> as, as the decades go by. Yeah, there are other options. Right. And, and in terms of relationships, I was at the an Air Force event, I got to see... Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Goldfein, yeah, and the Chief Master guy. Sergeant of the Air Force. Oh my goodness! It, it, boy, do they make an impression. So it was the yeah. his counterpart, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, uh, Caleb yeah. Wright, and and they were talking about something very similar about uh, the high rates of suicide in the Air Force, and you know talking yeah. about just how important that was. And uh, uh, boy, you couldn't be in that room and not feel like this is something that was of incredible importance to them. And so that was notable. The second was the their working relationship between. General Goldfein and Chief Master Sergeant uh, Wright. Can you talk about that relationship uh, in your own experience, you know, whether it was as a 
0106. Can you describe what that nature of that relationship and why that was important? Yeah, no, it, it's absolutely uh, fundamental to uh, doing business in the Navy and the Air Force and the Army, right? And each of those uh, kind of what you might want to call your senior enlisted advisor or senior enlisted leader, you know, the character of it changes a little bit, but the fundamentals are the same. And I would say that, you know, as a junior officer, a Navy chief, right, the Navy chief's quarters takes great pride in in uh, knowing that one of their missions is to kind of shape and train these junior officers who come right out of school. We've got no fleet experience, and they're going to take us under their wing and you know turn us into effective naval leaders, right? And so that is uh, just instilled in all the chief's training is that this is a big part of your, uh, you know, your responsibilities. But where I found it was amazingly uh, effective was uh, when I first took command of Honolulu, right? The the submarine I commanded. It's an epic uh, position on a submarine. It's called the chief of the boat, uh, the Cobb. And, the, you know, I had the best Cobb. His name is Billy Kramer. He is uh, just like a brother to me still. You know, I would say that 95% of the success of the submarine was because of Billy Kramer, right? I mean, because, you know, most of the uh, crew, I will tell you that, they knew me by captain, but they didn't know my name, right? I mean, captain, what's his name? I don't know. His name's captain. But, you know, they knew what the cop's uh, name was, and they knew what he had for breakfast that day, and they knew whether that agreed with them or not, and, you know, because <laughs> he was just in their life, right? And uh, he was just such a terrific guy. And, uh, you know, just for instance, you know, a new sailor would report aboard, and it's a, it's a nerve-wracking time for a, a young a man or woman to report to this new uh, command, this new submarine. And so there's a lot of uh, nervousness and anxiety. Cobb Kramer would sit them down like on their, within their first week for sure and say, Hey, look, this is the way it's going to go. You know, your first year is going to be very hard, right? You're going to have to qualify. You're going to have to do your time in the galley. You're going to have to do all of these things and it's going to be hard. And there's going to be times where uh, it's going to feel, you know, really hopeless, but you're going to get through it, right? And so take heart. And here's, you know, kind of your mentor, your sea dad, who can help you in those times. And then if you need to, you come and talk to me. So, and then after that year, you know, life gets a lot better. You're fully qualified. You're going to be a leader then, and you're going to help other people through this year, and uh, and you're going to go on to great things. So, you know, hang tough for this year. Don't let that discourage you. And then he would say, okay, now we're going to call your mom. And uh, <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, no, no kidding. So what's your, home, what's your mom's number? And so he would call up, and he would talk to this person's parents and say, hey, you know, we have Petty Officer Smith on board here. I'm the chief of the boat of the USS Honolulu. He's good. He's safe. He's sound. He's he's looking good, and uh, we got him. Here's my number. And if you've got any questions about uh, you know him at all or her, you give me a call, and I will answer you immediately. Right. And so there was just kind of this you know level of comfort, I guess, uh, to ease all of that anxiety that the cob had. And sure enough. You know, I had so many people respond to that, and it unfolded kind of exactly as he said. But he always had the pulse of the crew, the respect of the crew, and he had direct access to me anytime, day or night, 24-7, to uh, come and tell me, hey, what's really going on on the deck plate, right? And uh, that is absolutely valuable to getting you know, a, an accurate pulse of your, your team. You know, are they really kind of behaving the way that you would hope that they would, right? Mm. And then uh, even up at the CNO level, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, the MCPON, you know, I had uh, a great MCPON. In fact, I'm still working with them now, Mike Stevens. <laughs> and he would, he and I would go and do these uh, calls just like you mentioned with Fingers Goldfein. And we wouldn't do them <laughs> separate. We, we would always do them together. You know, and I would have some people come up to me and say, Hey, that was really effective. You guys really kind of look like you like each other and, uh, you know, have fun together. I said, Well, yeah, it's because we do. And he said, Well, I'm going to try that. And I was like, yeah, Well, I hope, you know, 
Yeah, please. Permission granted. It's a great idea. So that partnership, right? And that no kidding, honest way to uh, have the the enlisted uh, community represented to you there. It was just uh, absolutely uh, critical to success. By the way, I have this big smile on my face as you're telling all these stories. Uh, and, and can you say with a little more detail, what is the area responsibility of Mike Stevens you described so brilliantly for Chief of Boat Billy Kramer? Kind of like what, what, what's, what was on his plate back then in terms of... There were- yeah, there were almost none. There was almost no guidance. You know, it's sort of like, look, Cobb, you go out there, you, you know, you're going to lead the Chiefs quarters. So, you know, that's that's uh, very clear. You know, I really want you to make sure that uh, the crew is taken care of and that I'm, as the captain, I'm not doing something inadvertent, right. you know, that uh, would actually work against their best interests. Or if there's some something that they think would be, you know, a change or whatever, I, you know, I would want every one of those uh, to be very comfortable coming up to you, describing it to you, knowing that you could get it to me or whatever it might be. So it's a pretty loose uh, <laughs> position <laughs> description, you know, but if you've got the right person and the right partnership, and I think that a lot of the uh, the effectiveness and uh, the authority, if you will, of the uh, chief of the boat or the MCPON come from that relationship with the captain or the CNO, right? And so, you know, without that, you know, it, it, it's kind of a moot point. And just to make sure I've heard that correctly, it, it sounds like you're also suggesting that there's this kind of a, a broad discretion, at even at the MCPON level, due to the entire U.S. Navy as the chief of boat would do for the USS Honolulu. Yeah, so whereas the Cobb of the Honolulu, Billy Kramer knew everything about every one of our 135 or so sailors, right? Yeah, their strengths, weaknesses, family situation, kids, all of that. He was just terrific. Uh, you know, of course, that's impossible at the McPon level, you know, 330,000 sailors. But he's going to know his fleet master chiefs very well. Right. So those people, uh, the enlisted senior enlisted leaders for each of the fleet commanders. And uh, he's going to be very mindful about, you know, who should we pick uh, for the next uh, person to fill that role, given that that person's going to be the fleet commander. You know, how are we going to match these folks to make an effective team? And uh, so, you know, it's, it's as structured as you might think would happen in the executive level. In fact, mm. it is kind of an executive position. I think it would be interesting to see how you could come up with kind of a, a business equivalent of the chief of the boat, you know. Let me just preface this by one thing. I'm, I'm looking to, I met Lieutenant General, formerly Air Force, now Space Force. He's working with a friend of mine, Dr. McKirsten, CEO of TaskTop. We're talking about how do you stand up more repeatedly these software capabilities, whether it's in the U.S. Air Force and the Marines. Um, I'm sure there's a similar initiative in the U.S. Navy. He said something that I found incredibly impactful. The, the context of the this specific quote was, what's preventing us from achieving our goals faster? Is it the technical capabilities or whatever? And I, I think a Lieutenant General had this aha moment says, oh, no, it's, it's leadership. Yeah. <laughs> what's missing is, you know, we're missing a leadership capability. When you ask, you know, hypothetically, what is the equivalent in a corporate structure of the MCPON? You know, I, I've spent a lot of time trying to wonder, you know, what is the software equivalent? You know, as you find an organization is trying to build digital capabilities, you know, no board is not talking about digital disruption. You know, is there something missing <laughs> or is it already there, right? I mean, so do you have an intuition of where a software capability needs a company needs to go is it a role like like in a, a mcpon what does your intuition tell you about like where these capabilities need to show up i think uh well one uh i'm gonna have to uh learn from eugene you know what uh more about these software companies uh not as familiar as i probably should be but um i would say that a uh, a representative sort of the let, let's say the coders or, or whatever it might be you know the people uh, that are working at that level, uh, who have so much uh, knowledge of uh, the challenges and opportunities, you know, the person who can, and, and they also see obstacles and you know all of that uh, exists there. Having a representative for all of that part of the organization, uh, which really makes everything happen, to the person who has a, a lot more authority, you know, so you connect this knowledge to the authority. You can really, if there's a receptivity there, you know, a willingness to listen, 
boy, uh, you could just start knocking down obstacles. And it, that gets to your question. Why does this rule exist? You know, everybody it's just making everybody crazy going to these LARBs all the time. Uh, <laughs> why do we do that? And, you know, the cop or, or the software equivalent of the cop can say, we don't see any value. There's just a giant frustration down there. And you can scratch your head and say, shoot, I don't see any value either. I, I never thought of it, to be honest. But now that you've brought it to my attention, I've got the authority to eliminate these things. So let's do that and uh, come to a better, faster, more effective way. And, and, you know, as we go through this revolution now, I think that there's going to be even more of a need to identify those obstacles that are sort of vestiges of the past ways of doing business that have no relevance anymore to, in, in a software world, you know. Mm. Uh, but it's going to be kind of, you know, back to the basics. I, I'm sorry to keep harping on this like a broken record, but how are you going to get your people to just, you know, be as free as they can possibly be, uh, instilled with all the trust and confidence that is founded on uh, a common development program that you can just, you know, unleash them as unconstrained as possible. And I apologize that, I mean, I feel like I might have inadvertently sort of slotted that that software component, believe, you know, is the you know, would ideally show up just at the MCPON level. I mean, clearly, I think the vision you're painting is like, no, 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 at the most senior ranks of the officer level, right? Uh, Absolutely. If this is important, there's something with authority and responsibility. Yeah, one thing that I'm talking about now as I, you know, continue to work in this space is uh, if you think about building a, a ship now, right? And uh, historically, what we would do is we would have a team design the ship, build the ship, and then launch the ship. And it would, you know, essentially be at its peak capability on launching. And then for a number of reasons, it would sort of become less capable over time, material uh, or, or uh, you know, maintenance, uh, you know, the rest of technology moves forward. So its relevance, uh, its relative capability decays over time until it goes into a, a maintenance period, sometimes a long and costly maintenance period. And then it gets kind of a refresh and goes, it becomes more capable and, and then you start again. So, but the modern way of doing it, I think, and software has a huge uh, role to play here, is there's really kind of three levels, uh, timescales uh, involved with building a ship right now. So there's the hull and the propulsion system and those sorts of things. They're going to last for the life of the ship, which can be 40, 50 years, right? So put a lot of thought into that, you know, very hard to change that out. And then, th then that's the truck, if you will. Then on board that truck, there are... Uh, systems that you load in. You know, I, I'm preaching to the converted here, Gene, so correct me to 100% if I've got this wrong. But, you know, those systems kind of move at Moore's Law types of time scales, right? Processor, they're mostly processors, computers, SCADA systems, those sorts of things now. And so that's the hardware that goes in the truck, in the, in the hull. But now what we're seeing is there's another layer still, which is software. And the software really moves as fast as you can code it and validate it. And so now that makes better use of all those apertures, better use of all those systems, you know. And so now when, you, when that ship is launched and goes out into its environment, because of software updates, it can actually get more capable over time, right? <laughs> and, uh, and if you could tighten that feedback loop, it becomes absolutely essential to learning faster than the, than the enemy, right? Because you're out there and you're in the middle of, uh, you know, whatever sea close to the enemy, you detect some signal or some, you know, something that you haven't seen before, right? So uh, your systems aren't attuned to it, but you've recorded it and you send that record back. You know, the, the people that are in the system design business, you know, decompose it, deconstruct it, dissect it, come up with a uh, countermeasure for it. It's all in software. Then they push that out to the entire fleet. You know, the yeah. team that does that fastest wins, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so this this time scale associated with software becomes fundamental to the speed at which the Navy learns. Gene here. I love what. Admiral Richardson just said, one of my mentors, Dr. Tom Longstaff, who is again a CTO at the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, he was telling me about briefing a general that we should ideally be able to upgrade the firmware of a missile <laughs> while it's in flight, <laughs> which I thought was one of those typical, amazing, audacious Longstaff goals of which he is famous for. 
which I guess these days is maybe not so crazy. I think certain parts of the Air Force are actually demonstrating the ability to upgrade software in F-16s and U-2s while they are in flight. So maybe not so crazy after all. The other thing I want to mention here before we conclude part one of the interview is that Admiral Richardson did send me the Navy Leader Development Framework version 3.0 document. And again, it is awesome. Like the Designing for Maritime Superiority document, uh, the Navy Leader Development Framework addresses so much of what Admiral Richardson talked about. So it's about 20 pages long, and it describes the three lanes that everyone must progress down, the three ways to learn. So I'm going to read some sentences from the introduction because it's so good. It reads, The design for maintaining maritime superiority makes it clear that our Navy faces a competitive security environment unlike the past 25 years. Prevailing in an environment with this pace and complexity demands agility and urgency. It also demands maximum performance from our most important asset, our sailors. In support of this, we will be a dominant naval force composed of outstanding leaders and teams armed with the best equipment that learns and adapts faster than our rivals. Every person and every unit in the Navy will maximize their potential and be ready for decisive combat operations. To win, our leaders must enable our teams to think more clearly, learn more rapidly, and make better decisions more quickly and more accurately than our adversaries. And the Navy Leadership Development Framework describes how to achieve this imperative. So, next page is Why Leader Development 3.0, and describes the three lanes on the path. Lane, so, lane one is competence. Develop operational warfighting competence. We must become experts at the jobs as we grow. An incompetent leader is a recipe for disaster. Lane two is character. We must continually strengthen our ability to behave consistently with our core values of honor, courage, and commitment. This keeps us worthy to lead our sailors. And then, as promised, here is lane three, developing intellectual and personal connections. Intellectual connections improve competence by sharing mental models, comparing notes, improving our ability to anticipate our teammates' next move. Ah, isn't that interesting? Personal connections strengthen our character and resilience by building relationships. We share what we experience and seek to understand what's going on in others' lives not only in mind, but in body and spirit as well. And later in the document, page seven, the three methods to progress down the path, schools, offering formal education and certification, on-the-job training and qualification in our workplaces, and self-guided learning through reading and other forms of self-study. <laughs> it's all in here. My favorite parts of the document is page 16 and 17, where it paints what you're expected to learn over the 30 years if you are an enlisted leader or an officer leader broken down to how one progresses you know, every you know, one to three years. Ah, <laughs> it's, it's really great. Uh, there will be a link to it in the show notes. So I hope you learned as much from this interview as I did. Coming up next will be part two of this interview. I will ask Admiral Richardson about the leader development process, especially at the most junior levels. I'll ask him about lowering the cost of change and how he thinks about it from a leadership perspective. And I get to ask him about one of the largest functional organizations of all in the U.S. Navy, that is the U.S. Naval Reactors Division, and his thoughts on what do you do when things go wrong in a complex system? How do you balance keeping people accountable and enabling the right types of learning. See you then.